Hatchet, Chapter 14, Mistakes Small mistakes could turn into disasters. Funny little mistakes could snowball, so that while you were still smiling at the humor, you could find yourself looking at death. In the city, if he had made a mistake, usually there was a way to rectify it. Make it all right. If he fell on his bike and sprained his leg, he could wait for it to heal. If he forgot something at the store, he could find another food in the refrigerator. Now, it was different, and all so quick, all so incredibly quick. If he sprained a leg here, he might starve before he can get around again. If he missed while he was hunting, or a fish moved away, he might starve. If he got sick, really sick, so he couldn't move, he might starve. Mistakes Early in the new time, he had learned the most important thing, the truly vital knowledge that drives all creatures in the forest. Food is all. Food was simply everything. All things in the woods, from insects to fish to bears, were always looking for food. It was the great single driving influence in nature to eat. All must eat. But the way he learned it almost killed him. His second new night, stomach full of fish and the fire smoldering in the shelter, he had been sound asleep when something he thought later might be smell had awakened him. Near the fire, completely unafraid of the smoking coals, completely unafraid of Brian, a skunk was digging where he had buried the eggs. There was some sliver of a moon, and in the faint pearl light he could see the bushy tail, the white stripes down the back, and he had nearly smiled. He did not know how the skunk had found the eggs. Some smell, perhaps some tiny fragment of shell, had been left, a smell. But it looked almost cute, its little head down and its tail up as it dug, kicking the sand back. But those were his eggs, not the skunk's, and the half-smile had been quickly replaced with the fear that he would lose his food, and he had grabbed a handful of sand and thrown it at the skunk, Get out of here! He was going to say more, some silly human words, but in less than a half a second, the skunk had snapped its rear end up, curved the tail over, and sprayed Brian with the direct shot aimed at his head from less than four feet away. In the tiny confines of the shelter, the effect was devastating. The thick, sulfurous, rotten odor filled the small room, heavy, ugly, and stinking. The corrosive spray that hit his face seared into his lungs and eyes, blinding him. He screamed and threw himself sideways, taking the entire wall off the shelter, screamed and clawed out of the shelter, and fell, ran to the shore of the lake. Stumbling and tripping, he screamed into the water and slammed his head back and forth, trying to wash out his eyes, slashing at the water to clear his eyes. A hundred funny cartoons he had seen about skunks. Cute cartoons about the smell of skunks, cartoons to laugh at and joke about, but when the spray hit, there was nothing funny about it. He was completely blinded for almost two hours, a lifetime. He thought that he might be permanently blinded, or at least impaired, and that would have been the end. As it was, the pain in his eyes lasted for days, bothered him after that for two weeks. The smell in the shelter in his clothes and in the air was still there now, almost a month and a half later, and he had nearly smiled. Mistakes. Food had to be protected. While he was in the lake, trying to clear his eyes, the skunk went ahead and dug up the rest of the turtle eggs and ate every one, licked all the shells clean, and couldn't have cared less that Brian was thrashing around in the water like a dying carp. The skunk had found food and was taking it, and Brian was paying for a lesson. Protect food and have a good shelter. Not just a shelter to keep the wind and rain out, but a shelter to protect. A shelter to make him safe. The day after the skunk, he set about making a good place to live. The basic idea had been good. The place for his shelter was right, but he just hadn't gone far enough. He had been lazy. But now he knew the second most important thing about nature, what drives nature. Food was first. But the work for food went on and on. Nothing in nature was lazy. He had tried to make a shortcut and paid for it with his turtle eggs. 
which he had come to like more than the chicken eggs from the store. They had been fuller somehow, had more depth to them. He set about improving a shelter by tearing it down. From dead pines up the hill, he brought down heavier logs and fastened several of them across the opening, wedging them at the top and burying the bottoms in the sand. Then he wove long branches in through them to make a truly tight wall, and still not satisfied, he took even thinner branches and wove those into the first weave. When he was at last finished, he could not find a place to put his fist through. It all had held together like a very stiff wooden basket. He judged the door opening to be the weakest spot, and here he took special time to weave the door of willows in so tight a mesh so that no matter how a skunk tried or porcupine, he thought, looking at the marks on his leg, it could not possibly get through. He had no hinges, but by arranging some cut-off limbs at the top in the right way, he had a method to hook the door in place. And when he was in and the door was hung, he felt relatively safe. A bear, something big, could still get in by tearing at it, but nothing small could bother him. And the wave of the structure still allowed the smoke to filter up through the top and out. All in all, it took him three days to make the shelter stopping to shoot fish and eat as he went, bathing four times a day to try to get the smell from the skunk to leave. When his house was done, finally done right, he turned to the constant problem. Food. It was all right to hunt and eat or fish and eat, but what happened if he had to go a long time without food? What happened when the berries were gone and he got sick or hurt or, thinking of the skunk, laid up temporarily? He needed a way to store food, a place to store it, and he needed food to store. Mistakes. He tried to learn from the mistakes. He couldn't bury food again, couldn't leave it in the shelter, because something like a bear could get at it right away. It had to be high, somehow high and safe. Above the door to the shelter, up the rock face, about ten feet, was a small ledge that can make a natural storage place. Unreachable to animals, except that was unreachable to him as well. A ladder, of course. He needed a ladder, but he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on, and that stopped him until he found a dead pine with many small branches still sticking out. Using his hatchet, he chopped the branches off so that they stuck out four or five inches. All up along the log, then he cut the log off about ten feet along and dragged it down to his shelter. It was still a little heavy, but dry and he could manage it. And when he propped it up, he found he could climb to the ledge with ease. Though the tree did roll from the side to side a bit as he climbed. His food shelf, as he thought of it, had been covered with bird manure and he carefully scraped it clean with sticks. He had never seen birds there, but it was probably because the smoke from the fire went up right across the opening and they didn't like smoke. Still, he had learned and he took time to weave a snug door for the small opening with green willows, cutting it so jammed in tightly, and when he finished he stood back and looked at the rock face, his shelter below, the food shelf above, and allowed a small bit of pride to come. Not bad, he thought. Not bad for somebody who used to have trouble greasing the bearings on his bicycle. Not bad at all. Mistakes. He had made a good shelter and food shelf, but he had no food except for fish, and the last of the berries, and the fish, as good as they still tasted then, were not something he could store. His mother had left some salmon out by mistake one time when they went on an overnight trip to Cape Hesper to visit relatives, and when they got back, the smell filled the whole house. There was no way to store fish. At least, he thought, no way to store them dead. But as he looked at the weave of his structure, a thought came to him, and he moved down to the water. He had been putting the waste from the fish back into the water, and the food had attracted hundreds of new ones. I wonder. They seemed to come easily to the food at least the small ones. 
He had no trouble now shooting them, and had even spared one with his old fish spear, now that he knew how to aim low. He could dangle something in his fingers, and they came right up to it. It might be possible, he thought, might just be possible to trap them, make some kind of pond. To his right at the base of the rock bluff, there were piles of smaller rocks that had fallen from the main chunk of splinters and hunks, from double fist size to some as large as his head. He spent an afternoon carrying rocks to the beach and making what amounted to a large pen for holding live fish. Two rock arms that struck out 15 feet into the lake and curved together at the end. Where the arms came together, he left an opening about two feet across. Then he sat on the shore and waited. When he had first started dropping the rocks, all the fish had darted away. But his fish trash pile of bones and skins and guts was in the pond area, and the prospect of food brought them back. Soon, under an hour, there were 30 or 40 small fish in the enclosure, and Brian made a gate by weaving small willows together into a fine mesh and closed them in. Fresh fish, he yelled. I have fresh fish for sale. Storing live fish to eat later had been a major breakthrough, he thought. It wasn't just keeping from starving. It was trying to save ahead, think ahead. Of course, he didn't know then how sick he would get of fish.